My interview with uh, Rita Fan Shu Lai Tai, former president of the Legislative Council of Hong Kong. We'll take a short break, and when we return, China's wa warrior diplomats are on the prowl, according to some in the West. But what's really driving China's active defense campaign? Stay with us. Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi held his press conference, held his annual press conference on Sunday and answered questions on issues related to China's foreign policy. He said China's diplomacy is founded on 5,000 years of traditional culture of cherishing peace and harmony and that the Chinese people never pick a fight or bully others but have principles and guts. He said this while addressing a question on the so-called world warrior diplomacy, a term increasingly used in the West to describe China's evolving diplomatic style. Is this a suitable term? Why or why not? I'm joined from Oklahoma in the United States via Skype by David Moser, Associate Professor from Beijing Capital Normal University and in Beijing on the phone, by Xietao, Dean of the School of International Relations and Diplomacy at Beijing Foreign Studies University. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. But first, let's take a listen of one of uh, the, uh, a part of the answer Mr. Wang gave during that press conference. We never pick a fight or bully others, but we have principles and guts. We will push back against any deliberate insult to resolutely defend our national honor and dignity. And we will refute all groundless slander with facts to resolutely uphold fairness, justice, and human conscience. So David, let me go to you. Um, he was answering a question raised by an American reporter, and the question goes like this. We've seen an increasingly heated war of words between China and the United States. Is wolf warrior diplomacy the new norm of China's Diplomacy, um, do you agree with the premise of this question? Well, I mean, it's certainly uh, clear from, from what we've seen in the last few years that uh, China has moved beyond uh, the sort of Deng Xiaoping reform and opening uh, style diplomacy in accordance with the policy of, of, of keeping a low profile and biding your time, the Tao Guang Yang Hui, as they call it in Chinese. And uh, the ch Chinese uh, media people, diplomats, have decided to, to uh, seize the, the international narrative, to recover the international narrative and respond in real time to accusations and, uh, and threats against China, rather than, uh, as in the past, simply ignore them or just reactively respond to them uh, in time, you know, given, given their, uh, the importance or their threat that they represent. So yeah, fr from the Western point of view, this does seem like a new sort of a style, a sort of aggressive style. And in a sense it is, but it's in a response to an equally sort of aggressive uh, style, increasingly aggressive style in, in the Western news media. Professor Shear, what is your take on the same question? Professor Shear. <clears throat> I kind of like agree with uh, what David just said, you know, um, you know, with its growing economic and the military power, and that has generated the widespread uh, aspirations for global leadership among Chinese elites and citizens. Um, so they think you know, China does deserve a more important and more influential role in international affairs. And also uh, Chinese people do expect that other governments respect the Chinese economic uh, development model, its political system. And so when you look at you know, what happened in the past couple of uh, weeks or in the past two months, uh, especially in the wake of uh, COVID-19, there's come this growing criticism. And many of these are groundless slander against the Chinese government, uh, so-called alleged cover-up of uh, the initial coronavirus. And that really angered a lot of Chinese people and Chinese diplomats too. And so it's, it's unsurprising that um, some Chinese diplomats behaved as if uh, they are becoming more aggressive and uh, they uh, are more uh, like this so-called wolf uh, a diplomat. Um, so I think you know, Westerners do need to understand that you know, with this, this rising Chinese national pride and with its own uh, growing influence around the world, and Chinese people do 
I expect respect you know, from other people around the world. Well, um, Professor Xie, you actually touched upon a very interesting word or uh, two interesting words, national pride, because very often this kind of sentiment is uh, described to be nationalistic in the Western press, for instance. Basically, this war term, wolf warrior, was taken from this Chinese action movie where a Chinese hero uh, was defeating an American hero, the traditional you know, superpower or superhero. So um, how do you look at the connotation of this kind of um, stick? name giving let's say instead of stigmatizing professor shea first um, you know nationalism is, is you know it's universal uh, except in america and you know, americans don't like the term nationalism they call themselves patriots you know patriotism whereas we often call other people nationalists you know nationalism what is the difference i think americans believe that we our nationalism our patriotism is different or morally superior to chinese nationalism or German nationalism, Japanese nationalism, right? Uh, but, you know, back to the point I just made is that, you know, with China's growing power, and Chinese people do have that growing sense of pride. This is only very natural. You look at the trajectory of American, uh, you know, development in the 19th century and the 20th century, and with uh, rising American power, American people also have a, a growing sense of pride. That's natural. But look at, you know, like I said, you know, there's this growing Western criticism against the Chinese government, and that really upset the Chinese people. Hmm. Um, David, I want to go to you. If you have something to add down, you, you add on that, you're more than welcome. But I also want to get your take on um, some of the incidents, some of the examples we've seen, which have caused quite a bit of a discussion on the Internet, for instance, uh, what the uh, Chinese uh, uh, diplomatic representation in France, for instance, was uh, writing about and they had to ex explain, and what the uh, Chinese ambassador to Australia had to say in reaction, again, to some action from the Australian host, and he uh, also caused uh, quite a bit of a, a controversy. So how do you look at the, the, the action and the newfound tone of the Chinese diplomats vis-a-vis -vis the kind of atmosphere against China in the international um, discourse? Well, I think it's an inevitable uh, aspect of, of this sort of new uh, social media discourse. Um, I think that the Chinese diplomats are, are, are serving a role in being a sort of uh, a ready response team and an aggressive response team to what they see as baseless attacks or misinformation. I, do so, I am very worried, though, about the fact of, of this new phenomenon of diplomacy being carried out on Twitter and in social media. Uh, the problem with that is that di diplomacy is something that needs to take time and it takes, has to be carefully and cautiously worded and articulated. Social media is the, is the opposite of that. Everything, the reactions right. are hair trigger, they, the tone is belligerent. Uh, the, 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 the social media dis, uh, yeah, restrictions David. or the sort of... Uh, yeah, very yeah. interesting, very interesting point, point you raised. So I want to say two things. First of all, it's very difficult. I know uh, some diplomats abroad, it's very difficult for them to find some kind of opportunity to speak up. It's very difficult for them to publish articles, even rarer for them to be invited to shows where they, give, where they are given an adequate you know, opportunity to speak out. And then uh, Twitter, of course, is not the ideal space, but a lot of things are being said on the, on the Twitter. You've got to have some rational voices to balance things out. David, how do you look at that? Well, I agree. You have to have some rational voices to balance it out. The problem with uh, those, those platforms and that, uh, that, that, sort of disc that sort of media environment is that it's, it sort of precludes rationality. I mean, part of the reason is so. Is what, do, what is your suggestion? It's, it's very much. <laughs> it's, it's impossible. I, I think. I think the Chinese. I, no. Well, I think it's possible that the first of all, I think it's good that the Chinese respond. The diplomats respond in real time, but I think that it has to be measured. It has to be rational. It. it uh, there's Michelle Obama made a uh, her her slogan with uh, how the Democrats should deal with the GOP, the Republicans. Sorry. Go high. Yes. Yes. Okay. When they go low, when we they go low, we go high. Ideally, now, that is the case. That's easy to say. Yeah. Ideally, that is the case. To, it's hard to. Absolutely. It's hard to do, but I think it is possible. Okay. I think it is possible. Okay. I'm going to give 30 seconds to Professor Shear on this. What is really the measure way forward in this fragmented social media <coughs> age? Very just briefly, look, please. Just look at Donald Trump. You know, Twitter can become a weapon of mass destruction. 
if they are in the hands of the wrong person, and that could uh, cause terrible, uh, terrible damage to Chinese diplomacy as well as to American diplomacy. So I think you know David is right. You know we do need to take a careful look at how Twitter is used by some diplomats. Okay. Well, very interesting subject, and I hope we'll come back to this discussion in the near future. Many thanks to David Moser and uh, Professor Xie Tao. With that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with Alex. I'll try to be rational. Uh, that's it for this edition of The Point. You've got The Point. <laughs>